Hello everybody, my name is Aldo Mekori. I'm a Nigerian lawyer and entrepreneur. In 2005, I started a company called Chocolate City and the idea was to find young talented Nigerians who were either musicians or in the entertainment sector and just develop them. Uh, ten years later, that company has grown to be one of the biggest uh, entertainment companies in Africa. But all this wasn't enough to feed my spirit. I soon took on the role of social causes by funding and participating in a variety of youth empowerment projects across the country. And that is because I believe that business must have a purpose beyond just profit. I'm now traveling the African continent trying to find like-minded individuals who are not only successful in their own right, but are also making an impact in their own communities. This is profit with purpose. This is Shivers, win the right way. Tonight on Shivers, win the right way, we'll be chatting with Joel Masharia. He's the CEO of Abacus, which is a licensed data vendor in Kenya. Joel has come up with a web application that he says will help both local and global investors decide what shares to trade on and reinforce their decision with professional level analysis. It's a first for Kenya. The software seamlessly integrates real-time data and news on companies. It also provides both simple and advanced charting tools for analysis across all asset classes on the NSE, which is the Nairobi Stock Exchange. It will also help brokers and fund managers provide their clients with the tools to access their products and services via the internet and on mobile. I was so fascinated by this young tech entrepreneur, so I caught up with him to discuss his work over a glass of Shivers Regal. So my primary full-time job right now is CEO of Abacus, which is an online um, investment brokerage firm that's helping Kenyans in the diaspora and locally access investments in the markets here. So we're talking about stocks, we're talking about bonds, uh, mutual funds, unit trusts, etc. And we've been driving you know, a shift from how business is typically done on paper to actually enabling it be completely paperless and online and people sitting in the US can do it in 15 minutes. Uh, but alongside that, um, I'm the principal of a company called Capital Associates, which is a private investment company that my co-founder and I started about seven, eight years ago. And we've made investments into different kinds of businesses, Abacus being one of them. We've got um, a resort somewhere about 200 kilometers outside of Nairobi and a poultry farm about 250 kilometers um, outside of Nairobi, where we produce um, chicken for a processor that's based in Nyeri. How old are you? <laughs> Uh, I'm 29 now. Um, wow. Actually, I remember this very well. Capital Associates um, the Incorporation started on my birthday, my 21st birthday. And it was pretty much, you know, just decided I want to move away from the hustle and, and trying to make a buck by just selling cars and selling everything into a more corporatized kind of space. Mm -hmm. And I decided I wanted to set up an investment bank. Uh, yeah. How old are you then? This is a 20. It's, it's still, still the same year. At 21? Year. Yeah, at 20, 21, actually. Wow. This is in 2007, I incorporated Capital Associates with the idea that, and I still have this, and I, I don't know that I can find this check. Mm. I wrote myself a check for a billion shillings nice. at 21. Um, so how, how much do you have now? <laughs> I have enough. How does a 21-year-old guy start several businesses? Uh, was it your parents or what was your influence? Um, Partly my parents. Uh, my mom worked, you know, as, as a government official, but she had a farm. That she, you know, she was supplying poultry to hotels in Nairobi mm -hmm. and so my childhood you know is, is a phone calls coming in on the landline at about say 9 p.m. and it's it's a grand regency in Nairobi and they're saying hey we need um, 400 chicken tomorrow morning by 4 a.m. My dad used to take me along whenever he had banking errands. He worked in the bank? No, no, he worked, um, he used to run factories for Kenya Tea Development Agency so he was pretty much in the in the processing space manufacturing um, processing tea but whenever he had banking errands like on weekends He'd take me along or he'd take one of his kids, mostly because he didn't like to queue. <laughs> but you know, when you're, when you're four years old and you're yeah. told to stand in the line and you wait until you get to the counter, it's, um, you, you feel very mature, right? What is the, the aim of this app? Is it for the regular person who wants to invest in the stock market? I mean, how does this work? It has very many connotations when, or ideas when people hear stock market. They think gambling. So they think, you know, we're betting on stocks. Um, there's a whole bunch of those things that we're trying to correct. So one of the things that we do is we run the Abacus Money Academy, which is an online and instructor-led course that's hosted at um, one of the best business schools here. Okay. Uh, and we've developed the course to help people understand not just how the stock market works, but how to get into different kinds of investments. The stock market is just one facet of it um, and what we are trying to do is to make it as easy for people to practice 
and get investments into this for as little as a dollar fifty. So you can get started for as little as that. That is a US dollar now. Yes, US dollar, um, which is about a hundred shillings and hundred and fifty shillings, one hundred and fifty Kenya shillings. Okay. You can actually buy your first set of shares. When when people think about the stock market, there's always the risk. You yes. Know? So what if I gave you my life savings and you know, poof, it goes. What is the? Is there some sort of? Uh, assurance that I get my money back or insurance or something like that? So we, number one, don't take people's money um, because we're not licensed as a, as a fund manager. So what okay. we do is to present these opportunities. And, and that's a very good question because what we've had that question come in a lot of times. And aside from just the stock market, what we have on Abacus as well is other investment um, options. So you can start with bonds, which will guarantee you a return and will guarantee your capital, yeah. which is a government paper. So unless the country really goes to crap, that's going to be assured that you're getting your money back. Yeah. Um, and then moving along that way all the way to derivatives on the other risk side where you could lose everything and your kitchen sink. Yeah. So we're providing access to each one of this. Um, we're trying to, because we, we look to build for scale. Um, when you're coming in, one of the first things that you know, the system should, will do is to actually ask you a series of questions. I did some looking up on you, obviously. Um, I was really fascinated with not just the age, but what your business is doing in terms of impacting people. Yeah. Uh, and my question is, what is business to you? I mean, what does that mean in terms of the impact that your business has on people, on regular Kenyans and et cetera? We'd like to allow people access these opportunities to make money um, that are usually reserved for banks, that are essentially taking the same money that we are saving in these banks and then you know, lending to the government or lending to companies. So we, we were trying to make it as simple as every ordinary Kenyan who has internet access can actually access this um, at the moment, which is, you know, just basically having a smartphone or having access to even a cyber cafe, which, you know, there's a whole bunch of them all over the place. What occurs to me is that there are many young Africans out there who want to go into business. Uh, half of the problems is that they don't have the education or they don't have the resources or they, they think what they have isn't enough. Yeah. Uh, to start a business. Um, what would be your advice to people who do want to start something? Start with what you've got. I think the last time I completed formal education was high school. I did a couple of years at the wow. University of Nairobi and, and then I realized really what I wanted to do and what I was learning by myself was completely different from what I was, I was learning in school. School okay. was still maybe 20, 30 years behind. So the other thing that you know essentially I'll tell people is not to rely on you know what has been determined previously to be the way. So you figure out your own path, right? Um, everything I know about finance is from reading by myself. Wow. Because when I was in high school, we, were not, we weren't taught how to invest in, in stocks. I taught myself how to do it. I, I would, um, and when I left high school, what I'd do is, because you know, internet access wasn't as prevalent as it is today, we didn't have internet at home. Mm. I'd come to town, cyber cafe, spend maybe 500 shillings, which is about eight hours, yeah. reading, downloading, reading, downloading, and then burning CDs. Okay. And then I'd go yeah. home, and um, so my dad had a computer that he used to keep, we weren't allowed to use, I guess, because, you know, um, and it used to be kept in a box. He had bought it, he hadn't opened it. What he didn't know is that I'd go home, <laughs> open it up, plug and in, read, it, yeah. read, read, read everything I needed to, and then when I had to get home, I'd quickly unpack it and put it back in the box and put it back where it was. Um, and that's how I taught myself. A lot of the young people today, you're spending a lot of time watching MTV and you're watching, um, you know, you're seeing all these rappers with the big cars True. and you're sitting in traffic or walking past and you see somebody else driving, you know, a young person driving a big car and you think you want to go from where you are to, to that, to that Range to Rover. Success, yeah. You don't want to do the KSK, you don't want to do the small Toyo, you don't, no, you want to go straight from where you are to the Range Rover and that's almost impossible. You know, because we work in technology as well. You read the stories of people who are raising 30, 40 million. Exactly. Andela, for instance, has raised $25 million. And you're thinking, I, you know, I want to raise $25 million. Space, you know, I should yeah. be in that same space. And I'm trying to jump in there before, mm. without understanding what it's taken for, for a company like that it, to get in there. In fact, I, I think one of the things that you find with business is that sometimes you can grow a bit too fast. Exactly. Yeah. And you need to pace yourself. You need to be able to grow organically, so to speak. Yeah. One of the things that strike me is that Many people assume that business is a microwave process. You know, so you press the button, and, uh, count to three, and then it's all hot and ready to go. But it, 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 you need to do some cooking. Yesterday, I had a very interesting conversation with a friend of mine, and I was, I was telling her that there's a part of me that feels like I could be way, way ahead of where I am. But she reminded me something, and, and because she's been a friend of mine for maybe 10 years, and she, she was explaining to me that the one thing that I told her really, really early on was that I wanted to build a business that I was happy with. Mm. And 
that's a business that has integrity at its core. I'm not going to take, I mean, because, you know, we handle people's money. If I wanted, if I was unscrupulous, I'd just dip into that and take a loan, kind of like what's happened with a few banks here, mm -hmm. structured properly, and then tomorrow I'd be driving a Range Rover. But I wouldn't be able to do that because it's not who I am. I, I, I just can't yeah. do things like that. And so that's been one of the things that I'm trying to instill to my team very, very much in terms of, you know, consistently telling them, yeah, we can cut corners, but cutting corners essentially will just destroy our business. We'll never get to where we want to go. And two, we're trying to build a business that we can sleep easy, a business that runs itself, a business that we know fundamentally we don't have to think about responses because they're built into the core of the business. We're not going to lie about anything. If we've messed up, we've messed up. And so it's a painful process. But it gets easier as you go along because on um, every level that you proceed from, so in terms of integrity, in terms of um, you know, efficiency, uh, we build on top and we make sure that we've you know, locked down one level before proceeding to the next. People like to talk about the successes. Yes. Um, but I find that there's so much more you learn from failure that success can teach you. So, I mean, what, what, what have you learned? Have you had any failures in the past? And, and what, what are the lessons you'd like to kind of isolate for, for, for the viewers? I've had a lot of failures, but I don't like to consider them failures, I consider them lessons. Because otherwise, where, there would be a failure if, if it happened and then I stopped doing what I was doing or yeah. stopped trying. Um, I mean, 2007, going from having a million in the bank to four and a half million in debt, at, you know, within 12 months. And, and there are all kinds of things that I can attribute. I could say, you know, the country almost went to war the post, with the post-election violence. It was a bad environment. Markets were crashing. Credit was drying up in the U.S. because this is the 2008 credit crisis. So everything just was a bad environment. But I kind of like to think that there were people that went through that space and still came out successful. So it's, it's um, I take it as a lesson. And the way I see it, because I've, I've got a very interesting board of directors. My chairman handles one of the largest public um, investment companies in Kenya, the, yeah. the capital for that. Mm -hmm. And he told me that your struggles don't go away. It's only that uh, you might be struggling for um, a half a million shillings. You know, I might have been struggling for half a million shillings at 22, mm -hmm. um, maybe 50 million at 30. At 40, I'll be struggling for 5 billion. Struggle never goes away. It's just the size sure. of it that, exactly. that stays. And I, I think, so I like to look at each one of these things that happened as mm -hmm a way of building um, resilience for that 50 billion shilling struggle because you need to be in a completely different kind of mind space. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that happened. I lost my entire business. I went back to my mother's house after having left, you know, and, and you can imagine having to swallow pride and say, hey, mom, um, is my bed still there? <laughs> can, I, can I come back home? My mommy hugged you. Uh, come she back. was like, you know, yeah, you come back in. Um, and I think that was, uh, that was the best thing that ever happened to me, honestly speaking, because at 21, um, you know, I had, I had my Lexus Harrier, I had my Lexus um, RX, I was in a two-bedroom apartment in Milimani. Um, I thought I'd arrived, you know, and then having to go back home to my mom's and, 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 and that whole stripping away of the mm. ego, mm. I think that was the best thing that happened to me because since then, um, my perspectives about business have been completely different. This is my place, my little bachelor pad. <laughs> bachelor pad. Come on in. Wow. Nice. Thank you. Nice. It's a bit hot. Let me take my jacket as well. It is pretty hot. Nairobi weather has been, has been pretty crazy the last... Oh, this is, this is fantastic. Who, who, who did that? Uh, that was done by a friend of mine. It's a, it's a local piece. Her name's Pauline. Yeah, so that's the place. Um, I, I, I love reading. You love Dino Ross as well, <laughs> I can see. Yeah. So Dino Ross, it seems like something your parents probably were listening to. So I mean, what was it like growing up? I grew up about 200 kilometers, about 150 kilometers outside of Nairobi at the foot of Mount Kenya. Um, I remember, you know, early childhood stories my mom would tell me was where I was born and where I spent the first maybe three, four years of my life. You had to be on the lookout for elephants walking out of the forest. Um, and they'd come foraging for potatoes and whatnot. So I went to private schools throughout uh, my education and boarding when I was 10. And I think that's also one of the things that drove the, 
you know, that, that drive for entrepreneurship came out of being in boarding and fending for myself. And then um, I think we moved to, to Nairobi about uh, in about 2002, I was in, in, in high school then. And you know, my, my mom who was, uh, my dad had been transferred to Nairobi and then my mom got transferred to Nairobi and we moved here and we moved to really far out of town. And um, so, you know, a couple of years later, I graduated from high school and essentially started trying to find my way around Nairobi. So I started with school, but my classes, I was admitted to, to law school. I like to think about it this way because I spent about a year living outside the city. Nairobi might have about 10 shillings. Let's, let, let's use this as an example. There's 10 shillings um, that you're trying that's in circulation. But unfortunately, there's about 100 people trying to get that 10 shillings. Um, you go outside the country, outside Nairobi, you've got one shilling, but you've got maybe two people trying to get that one shilling. So it's it's not as much money as you could make in Nairobi, but it's it's also a lot, um, you know, easier to do so if if you know what you're doing. So it's the competition's a lot smaller. So Nairobi, I guess, is part of everybody. And like I was saying, uh, we don't have natural resources per se, right? So everybody's trying to make something from every other person. So I decided to pay a visit to Abacus, Joe's company, just to see the man in action. So Joel, this is where it all happens. This is where it all happens. How many employees do you have in, the, in this company? Uh, we have a team of 10 uh, on, on basically full and part time. In Kenya, we have five. Um, we have the five that are in the office and even them, you know, they don't really come into the office. What we've, we've built is a company that pretty much you work when and where you are. Um, I think my, my front-end designer, the graphic designer is I think in Malaysia or Indonesia who was traveling somewhere but he still submits his work on time and what we've done is to build completely um, paperless and in the cloud business. With every business companies are always about people. Um, you can have the greatest structures but without the right people. Uh, so, so what is your approach to hiring the right people? I hire very young and um, very Why? You don't like old people? Uh, no, are you discriminating? <laughs> Against for, old for, people. For, no, I'm not. I'm not. It's, it's not about the age. Also, it's it's, it's about also cost. It's you know, um, and then two commitment tends to be very different um, between somebody who's at home living with the parents versus somebody who's got a wife and kids, uh, and becomes a lot easier to get significantly more commitment in terms of when, especially when the business isn't working out really well. And you know, as a startup and in, in the very early stages, in the first five years of a business, mm -hmm. there's a whole lot of ups and downs, and you kind of want to have the same people being down with you as the same people that are up, up there with you. But also number two is because what we've seen is uh, due to, to, to innovating in financial services, we want to avoid having people who come in with the same mindset um, that we are trying to get to move from. Yeah. So what happens is you, you hire or you interview people and you see um, this guy left university, has spent 10 years doing something in this exact way and doesn't know why and doesn't understand how to do it any other way. And so that person can't really fit in. 10 o'clock, um, it's a work day, Yes. and I guess the markets are open. Markets opened um, about 30 minutes ago, but 30 minutes before that was ordered. Yeah. I think I can, I can sure. quickly so show you. Sure, so let's see how this, this whole how thing this works. works um, let me just log in. So and oh, you have a mobile version for the phones for, as well? Yes, available on Android and iOS, right. but the web, mobile web as well. And here we are. So. On this application, on the on, once you come onto the dashboard, what you see is actually like an overview of the market and what's opened up. So you can see the NSE 20 share index and, and the indices at the top. You can actually see which are the biggest gainers, top losers, mm. and it updates real time. Since we're streaming wow. this data, I think you've just seen it updating. Yeah. We're streaming this data directly from the Nairobi Securities Exchange onto the application. Yes. And we can see what's been traded today. We've got Market Watch where you can actually see the trades as they happen. It takes five minutes to withdraw your money into any M-Pesa bank account in Kenya. Mm. We actually move money faster than the entire banking industry has been able to do. And one of the reasons why we did this and why we focus so much on technology is because it frees up our staff not to do things but to think. We launched the trading bid maybe two, three months ago. On the revenues, I'm not actually allowed to disclose without having the, the, the you know, of sign off of my other shareholders. Mm. But we've hit um, 4,800 investors so far. Um, in the span of maybe six months, absolutely no marketing. Uh, we're starting to see the deposits growing. We've just crossed um, uh, $75,000 in people's money that's sitting on Abacus over the last two months, actually. We should have in excess of a million dollars of people's money that's been transacted through Abacus by mid next year, coming through our system and going into the various 
investments that we have. So where, where are you taking me to next? So we're going to head down to Strathmore University okay. and we set up um, one of the things that we saw because you know we, we're in the investment space and we, we like to look at the investment path. So the education part was what we were struggling with and so we decided we're going to set up the Abacus Money Academy and it's supposed to teach people how to invest and what your options are. The Abacus Money Academy teaches um, the various asset classes, how to invest your money, where the money actually comes from, how do you find the money to invest. And so that is actually run online and at Strathmore University. All right, cool. So let's, let's go. So SPS is a Strathmore Business School and it's under the Strathmore University who we've partnered with to help us in the delivery of our instructor-led component of the Abacus Money Academy. Mm. So essentially we host our program here and we work very closely with Strathmore to make sure that it actually ties in into, into um, like the market structures and, and it's actually a course that's relevant to what we are trying to get our users to, to achieve. With, with this particular program we actually want to see if we can scale it. Um, you know, and start licensing it. Because one of the things that unfortunately uh, we never learn in school is about money, right? So we are taught how to uh, go and work to make money, but nobody actually ever teaches about money. The partnership with SBS is your way of giving back to, to the community and especially young people who want to get to know a bit more about investments and et cetera and financial literacy. But why is this crucial to you? So two parts. One is, it's, it's, you know, for the business it actually helps us in the fact that more educated people will make investments and we hope they'll make these investments via Abacus. So it actually does build the business. You know, society, when, when I look at, you know, the situation where people are and, and having very small facets, being owning all the information makes it extremely difficult and unfair for, for everybody else. And I think, you know, trying to even the ground a little bit is, 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 is is you know is, is one of the things that we should all who those those among us that have the, the ability to do so should try to do i think one of the things that i've come to to realize in business is you know a lot of people kind of say i want to do this and then at the end of it i'll do this other thing but there's that path through it and so as we go along we're giving back you know with with education we're giving back um and and it kind of even uh, you know goes through all our businesses um, Sagana Farms, for instance, we want to make sure that in as much as we're building something, we're not the only ones who are benefiting from it. We're taking um, these farmers along with us. And, and, and Sagana Farms, which I started in um, 2013 when I was taking a break from the technology space, uh, we've, we've run experiments on how to get, distribute like large-scale um, benefits to small-scale farmers. Mm -hmm. So if it's, if it's retail, for instance, connecting small-scale farmers with large to small-scale retailers using large-scale infrastructure. If it's the poultry farm, for instance, where we run, uh, we do about 5,000 birds a cycle, which is... 5,000 birds? Yes, which is about every 42 to two months, every 42 days to two months. We have the capacity to do that. We have the money, the access to the necessary contracts, but the farmers around us don't. And so we're trying to figure out how do we then organize them into kinds of structures that would allow us to start to help them get to that kind of scale. So Joe, so many exciting things I've heard, um, fantastic story. But my question now is, how are these businesses impacting on the, the great people of Kenya, for example? How, how is this making an impact? Um, there, there are two things uh, in terms of, you know, aside from bottom line impact to how we deliver value for society as well. The first is, is we create jobs, right? And, and we all know, you know, Africa's horrific jobs of situation. Course, yeah. So being able to create jobs at, at the farm where we've got um, 12 people working on the farm at uh, the resort where there's probably 40 people or so working at the resort and, mm. you know, Abacus with its five, 10 people working on it mm. across different places. Yeah. I think being able to create jobs has been one of them. And I think one of the things I'm learning about creating impact is that Attempting to do it at scale is an extremely difficult thing. And so I'd rather try and um, find sufficient value for this one person rather than just tap, 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 tap a million people. Then, mm. you know, they know that you're trying to help them, but you only are able to deliver 100 Impact shillings. Impact is as great. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So I'd rather change somebody's, a single person's life mm -hmm. than really be a forgettable occurrence in a million people's life. But, but what's next? What's next for you? It's really to get things sorted out in Kenya. 
Um, but we still don't forget that we're trying to build a pan-African business. We want to be the entry point for anybody who's looking to make investments across the continent. To make it as simple as with one Abacus in investment account, mm. you can access Nigeria, Malawi, wow. um, Somalia even, because wow. there's, there's business that's happening yeah. there. So to start to channel um, these kinds of investments uh, into Cameroon um, and helping not just Africans, but also Africans in the diaspora invest back exactly. in, in, in their homes. There's a lot of money that goes into these markets, but it comes from, you know, it's Goldman Sachs making these investments, it's Morgan Stanley making these investments for their clients. It's not us making our investments exactly. into our markets. So that's one of the things I'd really like to be able to build over the next maybe 10 to 15 years. What is that, that tagline that defines you? Consistent pursuit of excellence. Because I, I don't think it's possible to achieve but the consistent pursuit of it. And it draws also from my high school motto, which was strong to serve. Right? So there's, there's strength in service. Um, so those two things. And that consistent pursuit of excellence in service, it's, it's, that's what I drive for. Let me propose a toast. Fantastic. To Abacus Pan Africa. And to the unending pursuit of excellence. Fantastic. Cheers. Cheers.